Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, a Full Mind production. At Full Mind, our vision is to ensure every child has access to an exceptional education. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Haley Spearbauer. Welcome back, everybody. I am always excited about recording an episode of the Learning Can't Wait podcast, but today feels especially unique for the reasons you'll find out in just a moment. But I have on today's episode two senior directors of learning design from Brain Pop. Uh, which I like to call EdTech's sweetheart. Uh, we have Dr. Michelle Neustadt, the Senior Director of Learning Design for STEM. Welcome, Michelle. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming and for introducing me to Dr. Barbara Hubert, the Senior Director of Learning Design for the Essentials Line. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much. Super excited to be here, too. So I have already done the fangirl thing for both of you when we were not recording, but I need to name that the reason why I am so uniquely excited about today's episode is my first experience as an educator with EdTech was with BrainPop. And so getting to meet the people that are making the future of BrainPop and redesigning and improving this tool that I used as a teacher, as the very first tech tool that I used, and also now that I use as a parent, is so incredibly like it brings me so much joy so really excited to talk to you both today so my first question for all my guests i like to know not just what you do today but how you how you started to do it how you became who you are so i'll start with you barbara how did you come to be the professional and personal version of yourself that is the a beautiful existential question. And uh, it is a nonlinear path, which I think is super, super exciting because so many people take these nonlinear paths to where they get. So it's nice to hear. Um, let's go back to my schooling where I think as a student, I didn't always feel like I was me met and seen as a kid in the classroom and sort of what my learning style was and, you know, made it through school was going to be a lawyer. And I got into law school and was like, I don't know if this is really what I want to do and 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 where I want to affect change. And I always knew that I very much was, was driven by equity and social justice and being a lawyer was not it. And I am so grateful that it, lawyers are great. <laughs> I'm just grateful that I took a different path. So I decided to um, join the New York City Teaching Fellows. I mean, 2008, I believe, and I was placed in a elementary special education classroom. And I both felt as a new teacher in that space, like wildly unqualified to be supporting kids who deserved the most qualified teachers in the world because they deserved to have their needs met. And it wasn't until later in life that I was like, wait, am I connecting with these kids because I was having a similar experience? And so it was just like a really um, point of investment. And I wanted to understand like their their learning trajectories and their learning spaces. And how did you come to be identified as someone with a disability? And I also in that time got to notice the strengths of those kids and all of the like beautiful thoughts that they brought into the classroom and the ways that they built community in the classroom. And I also wanted to understand like why our system, <laughs> again, really light and casual, like why is our system and why is our educational system like it is? So I went to get a doctorate and uh, my takeaway was that it's very, very complicated why things are the way they are. But where I can affect change most is really thinking around access and creating accessible instruction and accessible learning experiences for kids. And then I moved into supporting teachers to do that at New Visions for public schools. And then I came to Brain Pop because I wanted to have and bring that perspective to as many teachers as possible. And I feel so lucky every day to get to think about and hold kids central. I like will never, ever not think of my first class of fourth and fifth graders. And they are what drive me to do the work that I do at Brain Pop, knowing that it's going to impact teachers and help them deliver like inclusive, accessible instruction that is fun, that is engaging, that builds literacy skills, and also like that the kids are going to love learning. And so that's really, it's my journey to now and my uh, my day-to-day driver. What I really appreciate about you sharing that, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable. I think, you know, folks come, I'm noticing now onto the podcast more and more and are very vulnerable and authentic and share so many versions and sides of themselves and really 
what I appreciate about your story is how that has driven and been a linear kind of function for you throughout your path and how you're always relating back to your first experience in the classroom. So thank you so much for sharing, Barbara. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, same question for you. How did you come to be the professional and personal version of yourself? Same existential question. It is, yes. And similar to Barbara, it was, it was nonlinear. I was definitely impacted as a learner myself. I had some incredible middle school science teachers and my love for science was sparked. All of a sudden, I started asking questions about the world around me and I, I got that science bug, which was incredible. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So I actually, I taught skiing in high school. I had some great mentors and I was introduced to the education space. And I was like, how do I merge these two sort of passions of mine? So I actually, so when I got out of college, so I was a geology major. I loved being out in the world and like working in the field and all this I actually didn't know different career paths. I was actually, I worked in finance for a little bit. And then I realized I was missing something in my in my personal and career journey. And I actually started teaching um, middle and high school. And similar to Barbara, I there was just something so incredibly special, especially for me in the middle school space. I just saw the learner's eyes light up. And I also had way more questions that I couldn't answer myself as I was teaching. I was thinking to myself every day when I got out of the classroom, how could I maybe present this information in a way that maybe incorporates more of a student's prior knowledge or an experience so we really can connect it so science can become less abstract. And I was seeing that learners sometimes got caught up like if they had an idea and it went in a different direction, how can we support that original idea to get them to a more full science understanding. So my years in the classroom actually sent me to grad school because I had so many questions. And I was super fortunate in graduate school to have um, mentors to work on some grants. And I was introduced to the education technology space. I was studying curriculum and instruction, and I was working on a grant that built apps and tried to help learners um, scaffold their thinking and critical, basically critical thinking skills and reasoning in science. And I saw that I could go beyond my personal classroom space and reach so many more learners. And that's basically driven my career path since it's been about a decade in the ed tech space. And I am I feel super fortunate every day I get to build learning experiences for all kids, all learners in the science space and helping teachers and collaborating with people across the space to have that aha moment and spark that curiosity for our middle school kids. Michelle, I don't think I knew the origin of your geology background. And you and I have been connected through ed tech for a little bit of time now. And I'm really grateful that we've kept in touch because I love watching people do awesome things to help children. And so I appreciate that you named the scale at which you can really change lives with ed tech. And, and, you know, brain pop is. What I imagine listeners are sitting here saying, like, as I ask the next question is like, are you serious, Haley? Like for folks that are listening that don't know Brain Pop, are there any folks that don't know Brain Pop? Who are Tim and Moby? And what does Brain Pop do? Barbara, what would you say? Who are Tim and Moby and what is Brain Pop? (laughs) Yeah, Tim and Moby and our whole crew and cast of, of folks bring kids in to complex ideas and topics and really make those topics inviting, right? They they help kids come into a, a topic and to an idea and start making meaning for themselves around those ideas. Tim and Moby. Moby is our orange robot who uh preceded AI, I'd like to say. And he along with Tim, along with Annie, along with, again, like our, our cast of characters. I, I mean, I think one of the things that has endured about Brain Pop, we have been founded in 1999, right? So 24, I'm dating myself, 24 years. Uh, <laughs> you have to connect with kids to endure in that way over time. And now it's crazy because we have parents or, who were like, I grew up with, yeah, right? Like I grew up with Brain Pop as a learner and now it's part of sort of my world. And so I think the thing, one of the many things that has had Brain Pop endure is the way that not even just Tim and Moby, but our movies and our learning activities really connect with kids and hold that 
rigor, which I know is a sort of like overused word, but like really do hold that learning rigor and um, while also centering joy and playfulness and humor, right? Like you can't not watch a brain pot movie and just like be tickled. I, you know what? My kids don't know any Disney characters other than like maybe Mickey or Minnie, but they definitely know Tim and Moby. Like I told this story the other day that when my kids went to the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York City and we saw like real videos of volcanoes, they came home and said, do Tim and Moby have a video about volcanoes, mom? And I was like, yes, they definitely do. Let's go find it. You know, there's, to your point, there's a, a stickiness about the characters that have endured through a very long 24 years of building and creating, you know, you say joyful, joyful and rigorous content for children. Michelle, what do you think, like to what do you attribute the success? Like we just named a couple of highlights, but there's such a stickiness within schools. It, it, this, this primarily is not built for moms that are teaching their kids. Maybe it was primarily built. I imagine in its first iteration for schools. So how did it, how did the stickiness come to be and how has it persisted? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think about this a lot because, you know, the product I'm working on is a new product line for Brain Pop. So I want to make sure we're building on the core values and mission of the company and the pedagogical approach. So looking through it and Barbara, please add in as well. I think the engagement factor and meeting the kids where they are, there's a quirkiness. We, we, understand learners. We write to support learners across the board from all of our learning activities, from all of our movies. And it's an empowerment factor for our kids. And we also have the teachers at the center. We want to make sure what we're doing is supporting best practices for our teachers across the board. And we know every classroom space looks different. So building in that flexibility component also allows us to sort of have that stickiness across the board. And then in our new product lines and like brain pop science and stuff, that's what I'm, I'm currently working on. We bring that in as well. Like the learner needs to be at the center. They need to feel empowered. They need to see themselves as a strong, capable individual. And we can provide content and experiences that allow them to succeed. So that um, productive struggle and is always sort of at the core of what we do so we can really support that learner as well as the teachers. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's so funny. I, as a classroom teacher, I use Brain Pop as well. And I'm just trying to think as like I put on that movie, the light, the kid's eyes lit up, you know. So and I'm just trying to think back to, you know, why. And it was those hard questions that they ask you as a teacher, too. I feel like Brain Pop does a really great job of trying to answer those complex questions. Michelle, I'm just going to add, like, you could not be more right in that it's so interesting because there is this centering of a student as, as a human, right? Like, really, like, who are you? How do we, how do you see yourselves? How do we make sure that the representations are inclusive? How do we meet you and then make sure that that productive struggle is happening, but in a, almost like an environment that's like a little bit of a hug? Right. Like a little bit of like a safe space to like to to try something a little bit harder and to. Um, and I think also I wanted to say that you talked about teachers. And I think one of the thing that I've been at Brain Pop for probably three and a half years now. And one of the sort of consistent through lines, not even just in learning design, but across all of the different departments is that an empathy, not just for the student, not even empathy, like not even just an understanding for the students, but a deep understanding of a teacher and what a teacher needs and what are the ways that we can make your job a little bit easier because teaching is, it's, you know, as all former teachers, it's just like the best and hardest job in the world. And how do we make your jobs easier and your jobs teachers being like that accessible, inclusive, like high quality instruction, right? That really like motivates and engages your kids and, and and fosters and drives learning. So I think that it's just a beautiful thing at Brain Pop to see, I mean, that it doesn't just live in learning, but it's, it, it's a sort of a value that's held across the company. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's hard to have almost two end users to pay attention to as you build products and with unique and varied perspectives. That, that just makes that makes for a greater challenge. But anything in a tech is going to obviously have to consider both. And so 
I, I understand how centering the rigor and centering the joy and having this be really reflective of what teachers are doing in the classroom on a regular basis, but becoming an extender of that can be so powerful and probably accounts for a large part of the success that you all have had. I'm wondering though, you know, Michelle, how long have you been at Brain Pop now? It's two years. No. Two years. So, you know, a lot has changed in the three years, Michelle, or two years Michelle has been there and three years that Barbara has been here. And the forecast ahead of us looks really different, right? The the whole world, the way we think about technology and education is fundamentally different, fundamentally different today, April 28th, than it was three years ago at this time. So what is how does the that that amount of change in the world get reflected in the in the product? And what is the future? look like for continued improvement on in brain pop i'm happy to jump in let me jump in and talk about just sort of brain pop general, right because again um i you are 100 right right the world is a different place than it was three years ago and and i think what that has meant for not just education but at tech is that we have had to be more not deliberate, but like, how, like what you're doing and what you're bringing into your classroom has to have impact, right? And it can't be an assumed impact. It has to be a proven impact. And so I think from a sort of then to now, Brain Pop has always been just in addition to connecting with kids, we build that background knowledge. We build that vocabulary in a really wonderful and seamless way. We The literacy skills that we know kids need to make meaning and transfer to other spaces have sort of always been built into it. I think one of the biggest shifts that we've made is that now we're, we're making it explicit where before teachers knew why, and it was sort of like an intuitive, like, oh, I'm going to use this to build this background knowledge. I'm going to ask some questions around vocabulary. Now we have those skills explicitly built into many touch points in our product and districts and teachers are getting reporting and getting data on that so that they can really make formative assessment driven decisions, particularly around literacy skills, like the information and the data that that um, teachers and districts are getting from the usage on Brave Pop and how folks are, and kids are moving through those learning experiences are now giving teachers like next day, like, how can I plan my lesson knowing what I know about Barbara as a learner, how she's developing in this skill, how she's moving along in this content understanding. And I think we're really, we're really making that more explicit and also just serving it up to teachers in a more usable and actionable way. I think that's a big tenant that we hold on to, particularly around data and insights and reporting is that it has to be actionable, right? Like vanity metrics are vanity metrics. And so how does, yeah, right? Like I'm, I said a thing and maybe you can edit that out, but. I, no, keep that <laughs> in, please. I actually, we're redoing, we're redoing a lot right now. And I don't even know by the time this episode airs, we may actually have a completely new name, my organization. And we were talking about the website and I was like, ah, no vanity metrics. Like we can't like, and then we were like questioning because, I, so I have to double click on this for a second because. I am so grateful the industry is moving in a direction of requiring data. I have been the academics lead for almost like for, or, or co-lead or, or directly under the, lead, whatever it is. I've been on academics at my organization for six years. I led a school. I found all those things to say that it has been an uphill battle to get everyone to understand the importance of collecting and sharing data on impact and efficacy, but no longer, right? That is all you read in the media. It is bolded in the ESSER funding guidelines. It is now a like part of the lexicon of school leaders as they talk about buying products. That makes me so happy. It, it does. Makes me so happy. It does. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, of all the things to come out of the last few years, the fact that now we don't have to fight for it, that it is a requirement, is such a right direction. And that data. Data gets a bad rap, right? But data for good. We always have a Sarah at our organization always says data for good. And it's really that framing that I think is driving us, right? Data for good in a way that's usable, that's actionable, that helps learning happen. I love that. I mean, you probably could easily throw out a whole bunch of metrics that would blow people's minds. What percentage of schools, you could probably easily on this call tell me what percentage of schools use brain pop, how many students you've enrolled, how many hours they've accumulated on the app. And that's all important. 
as long as it's really driving effect and affecting change for student learning and for teacher efficacy and impact. Michelle, what would you add to that? What have I clearly add? This is a, a like a soft spot for me. I uh, love to talk about it. How, how does this land with you? And, and as you're thinking, I know science is a newer arm that you're building out and expanding and continuing to. How does that what does that make you think about for the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you and Barbara hit it spot on. I mean, one of the core pieces that we are being incredibly purposeful about is embedding formative assessment into our activities. We, it's to support the teacher, the learner at all points. I'll speak more from like the science perspective since the science classroom itself has changed quite a bit, even though our standards have been out for quite a long time now. We are still a lot of a lot of states, a lot of districts are really pushing now for multidimensional science. So in for what we're doing, we're really trying to scaffold claim evidence and reasoning experience and process into our whole learner experience. So this uh, this really builds on the idea of seeing the content and practices in multiple forms, in multiple concepts, so a student can see the application, so they can hopefully transfer that knowledge and also really build in uh, evidence-based writing skills. So what does that critical thinking look like? What does that reasoning look like? So within our science product, we're really working on scaffolding a learner to make observations and for those observations to become, to become evidence and tie evidence back to a claim that they're making. So, and with all that, it will still be, there's still opportunities for data to be, to come back to the teacher, to come back to a learner. So we can see that growth over time. So for our middle schoolers, we want to make sure that they're interacting with opportunities for them to make their thinking transparent for them to see how science is applying to their everyday lives and hopefully have those questions and asking those questions to their teacher and, and continue to spark that curiosity. You know, I furiously started typing while you were talking because I just read an article. It's, you know, so right now there's a big push in the literacy side of the house about the science of reading and how we need to embrace that and eschew other forms of uh, reading introduction because that's what the data tells us. Now, Michelle, I don't know if you saw this, and Barbara, I don't know if you saw this, but I'll, I'll share screens here. But there was recently an article with really early level data. It's still not peer reviewed. It's coming soon, but there's dramatic, robust data demonstrating what the new science of reading will be, which is that building knowledge can boost comprehension, right? So having that background knowledge, and like you said, seeing it in multiple modalities, seeing it in multiple occasions, interacting with it in different forms can have a dramatic impact on literacy as well. And so, I mean, yes, as a teacher, yeah, of course I can, but there's never been large-scale data to prove it. So I'm super excited about this. We are too. And I think that that's, I'm like, Michelle, please like jump in, but I, it's, it's, it's naming and it's contextualizing what we know about how comprehension is built, right? The more background knowledge that you have made meaning of to draw on, the more comprehension comes easier to you, regardless of um, like decoding or fluency, right? There's, and so I think what's so powerful, both across science, across brain pop, across brain pop junior is the building literacy through content and through connected ideas across that content, right? Like all across related topics and it just strengthens and builds that background knowledge. And I, it's just like, when you talk about a sweet spot, like I'm just gonna say brain pump has a couple sweet spots, but this, we do. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is really one of them. Right. And it's, it's the data is coming to prove it. And the article that you shared is, oh, Natalie Wexler is just 10 out of 10 recommend. Yeah. All the we're on the same page here right now the same page it always feels so good when you have these these notions that you know to be true from maybe not large-scale data subsets but like enough research or anecdotal experience to be proven it's it's really validating it's really really validating now i'm going to use the word sweet spot which i uh have in my like next question to you about brain pop which is how does the magic sweet spot of enthusiasm and rigor create outcomes? 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to start. And I know Barbara has has done some work in the outcome space. To look at outcomes, you need engagement, you need interaction events, you need teachers and students coming back, sort of going back to some of the components of stickiness. And also the opportunities like we just talked about in those multiple modalities, because learners, you can't just you can't just present content and uh, in one dimension. And we say, okay, a learner has learned that's, you know, from our space, we need to make sure we're looking across the board. We're looking across literacy science, but also some of the other skills that we know are, are just as important and they're all working in conjunction. So I think it's incredibly, I, I think that's where we look and that's, you know, we're looking at where learners continued interactions, continued engagement events where a, a learner and a teacher can say, oh, they presented this skill set here, and I'm also seeing it across the board in this other subject area, or I'm seeing it again in another modality. So it's sort of that complexity of the learner needs to come through in some of our efficacy and impact work. I 100% agree, Michelle. And I think uh, one of Brain Pop's like pedagogical sweet spots, right, is this sort of intersection of visible learning, like a la John Hattie, right? Like I know what skills I'm working on. I can see my progress on those skills alongside like sort of the pedagogy of play, right? How do we infuse choice? How do we infuse wonder and delight? And then also alongside really thinking about how do we universally design this learning experience and how do we have options for differentiating? So really drawing on all three of those frameworks together and create creates and helps us create those repeated skill engagement points in different contexts. So if I'm working on the same literacy skill, let's say um, finding the main idea, right? And supporting it with details, depending on my grade level, um, the complexity of that can change. But if I'm getting to practice that in uh, the context of the American history content, and then I get to practice that skill in the context of an ecosystem movie, like, wow, am I showing transfer? Because of the of the ways that brain pop builds in that skill engagement, and then again, you know, creates an accessible entry point for kids in getting to to play and engage with that skill. I love it. I think we always have to consider the sequential learning and how that really dramatically creates stickiness for kids. I remember one of the first math curriculums that had sequential learning back in the day that was deployed in New York City. Some of the teachers that have been in the classroom for a very long time were like, well, how are they ever going to master it if we only spend this much time on it? Like, how, but, but, oh, you do it again? Like, are they able to actually? And I was like, this makes so much sense to my brain. And I was a new teacher, so I didn't have their context and their wisdom and all the, the best practices. And it was definitely hard, I think, for them to adapt. As with anything, it's the same thing as you see what, that's happening with the science of reading right now. People having to throw out curriculums and start over and... It's challenging. I love to hear, though, the philosophy and approach to that in the design of the product at Brain Pop. And it's funny, I, you know, I have this memory and it kind of goes back to the earlier conversation about the article that I was talking about regarding the background knowledge. But our art teacher, when I was in the middle school, was teaching kids about silhouettes. They did a whole unit or a whole subunit on silhouettes. They watched Brain Pop videos on like artists who had done silhouettes. And the word silhouette was the, the center point of the third grade exam that year. And the kids ran out of the room and found the art teacher, Erin Moran Foley. If you're listening, you may be. They ran to her and said, Miss, Miss Moran, Miss Foley. I can't remember what her name was at the time. But you are the reason why we understood this passage. All the work we did to know what a silhouette was and understand that style of art, which again, like involved brain pop videos really helped students to grapple with challenging texts, which granted, it's not conceptual, it's vocabulary, but it was the box that they didn't understand that word, they wouldn't have understood the text. And that that is like, not that we want just for kids to perform well on exams, but it helps them to build upon their knowledge and tackle more challenging content as, as it's before them. I love that anecdote, Haley. Like that just perfectly captures like the what and the why of it yeah beautiful I was, I was worried that you'd be like wow she's telling another story of how she loves brain <laughs> but here we are here we yeah. are the love is real the love is so real um well you know i i really have loved this conversation and feel like we could spend many many more hours nerding out about the research and the science and all of the things that have helped to create 
the product that we all know and love, um, especially me. But I, I do want to make sure that I'm respecting you two very, very busy folks' time. And so I want to lead us to our last question, which is the same question I ask all my guests, which is what advice would you give a teacher starting their career? Michelle, I'm going to start with you. Ooh, I'm on the spot first. Okay. I would say make those connections with your learners. Get to know those kiddos as much as you can from day one. Ask the questions because, first of all, it'll make it so much more enjoyable because you spend so much time together, but it's also going to impact their learning and your teaching so tremendously because if you can make connections, if you can bring in their experiences, if you can make them seen as learners, it's just going to be incredible. They will learn. Approach every learner where they are and have fun with it. I, I miss the classroom days. I When I go in for observations, I just I soak it all up. The answers that kids give and stuff like that. Listen, be an active listener and let the kids drive discussions and, and, and all those pieces because it, it makes such an incredible impact on those kids' lives. I love that. I love that. I love that. Oh, teaching is so much about listening. And Michelle, you're the first guest that has ever called that out. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right, Barbara, same question for you. What advice would you give a teacher starting their career? A hundred percent everything Michelle said. And to I had a, my first grad class for teaching, I had a professor say, I'm going to give you three letters and I want you to hold on to these letters. And it's WSV win small victories because that mind frame of there's just you know as te- there's so much that you're thinking about and accountable for and want to do and excited about and like take the time to slow down and just celebrate those those small victories that you won so that would be my my send off wsv win small victories it's so hard to keep track of all the big wins or even like to fight yourself fight to get to the big wins Small victories, they help buoy you. They help motivate you. They're important. I love that. Barbara and Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. This has been a real joy for me and I'm sure for our listeners as well. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much. This was super fun. This was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. I mean, what could be more fun than nerding out on reading and product design? There's nothing better. There is nothing better. It's true. True. (laughs) Well, grateful for you and grateful for all, all of our, to all of our listeners for tuning in today. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and we'll chat again soon. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, Email us at podcast at fullmindlearning.com.